I would now like to introduce Dr. Carlos Alvarez. Dr. Alvarez is an associate professor in the Ohio State University Colleges of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. He began his career as a research technician in immunogenetics and transplantation at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston. He earned his PhD from Harvard University for neuroscience studies in fruit flies and mice in the lab of Walter Gilbert. He was postdoctoral fellow at the Scripps Research Institute and in the University of California, San Diego, where he studied psychiatric genetics in rodent models and humans using molecular biology, genomics, and bioinformatics. Dr. Alvarez's first independent position was as laboratory head of target discovery in neuroscience and ophthalmology. He is the inventor on Novartis patents involving cell growth, neuroprotection, and angiogenesis. He also developed a program on molecular and statistical canine genomics at Nationwide Children's Hospital and The Ohio State University. Dr. Alvarez's long-term interest is in canine-human comparative genomics with the ultimate goal of medical translation. His current focus areas include problem behavior and bone cancer, as well as understanding genetic variations that have effects on related and seemingly unrelated traits. We are thrilled to have Dr. Alvarez present to this year's Canine Health Summit. Please post any questions you have for Dr. Alvarez in the chat box, and he will answer as many as, as, many as he can during the live Q&A after his presentation. Welcome again, Dr. Carlos Alvarez. Hello, it's great to be here for the Embark 2022 Canine Health Summit. And I'll be talking about the genetics of dog behavior. We usually think of behavior as either being cognition or emotions. And today I'm going to be talking to you about emotions mostly, which are feelings and programmed actions for quick response to stimuli. One aspect of emotions is that we can feel them when we observe them in others. And here's a demonstration that we can even recognize them across species. So every fear, every emotion has a purpose. What is the purpose of fear? It is to avoid and flee danger. Across species, a very common source of danger is predation. And um, in apex predators like uh, wolves can be, you can also see it as here in submission and here you can see it in a domesticated dog. And so uh, for this conference, I don't need to explain why dog models are so powerful, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of aspects that are very powerful for complex genetics. And the first is that there's low diversity within breeds, but high diversity across breeds. Here I'm showing that for morphology, body size, uh, but it's also true for physiology, disease, behavior. And that makes it a, a very powerful organism for complex genetics. Secondly, when you do genetic mapping in dogs, you tend to find a lot of common variants that have a moderate to large effect size. And that means that the findings are clinically actionable. You can use them for breeding purposes. You can use them for medical purposes. And that's not the case with humans. So a couple of examples of what I'm talking about, the distinction between dog and human genetics for complex traits. First, I just showed you body size uh, differing across breeds. The uh, the full difference between the smallest and largest breeds by body mass is 40-fold difference. If you compare that to humans where you take the shortest population and the tallest, the difference between them is only 34%. If you then go and map <clears throat> these genetic traits like uh, body size or height, in humans, you would need over 5 million subjects to measure uh, the genetic difference in body size and height. And you would uh, figure out that there are over 7,000 loci associated with human height. 
Each one only contributes a small amount and many genes are involved. By contrast, in dogs, in a study of 4,000 dogs, they could establish that most body size is explained by 17 loci across all breeds. That means each of those variants has a large effect. That is a huge difference in uh, genetic mapping in humans versus dogs, and it shows how powerful the dog model is. Another trait that we study in my lab is osteosarcoma. It is the most common cancer of the bone in children, but in humans, it's a rare cancer. Only one mapping study has been done for osteosarcoma in humans, and it identified two loci. By contrast, in dogs, Carlson, Limblad, Toe, and colleagues did a study of 550 dogs from three breeds and mapped 33 loci. Now I'm going to tell you how we followed up that work to illustrate what I think is possible in behavior. So we followed up the Carlson study by doing a meta-analysis of all three breeds that yielded one additional locus. We validated their greyhound mapping in our own cohort of case control greyhounds. And we measured polygenic risk by developing models, and that allows us to prioritize the genetic findings. And lastly, we proposed two clinical trials of drugs that have never been used in osteosarcoma, either in dogs or humans. And we proposed that clinical studies in pet dogs should be done, and if successful, could be tried in humans as well. So the goals of our behavioral research in dogs is first to address the unmet veterinary and social needs. Second, to exploit the simplified genetics of the dog model to address questions that are too complex in humans. And thirdly, to identify drug targets and develop treatments and clinical trials in pet dogs and eventually in humans. In terms of traits that are ideal for this approach, we think anxiety is at the top because it's the most prevalent condition for mental health in dogs and in humans. And the efficacy of treatment is poor and the pipeline is weak for anxiety drugs. So here's the FDA timeline of anxiety drug approvals. What you first see is that the cluster that was discovered in the early 1960s to 1981 are essentially all benzodiazepines, and they have the downside that they're only short-term treatments. A second group of drugs that was developed later were drugs that were first approved for antidepressant and later approved for anxiety. The most recently approved anxiety drug that was first approved for anxiety was in 1986. And in the last 10 years, not a single drug has been approved for anxiety. So I propose that that can be accelerated by using dog models. On the bottom here, I'm showing you the typical timeline of drug development in humans. And the largest chunk of the average 14 years it takes and the uh, largest cost of that work is the phase one, two, three clinical studies. On top, I'm showing you what I imagine uh, companion animal clinical trials can look like. And they have the advantage that the phase one, two, three trials are optional. And what that means is that in less than five years, if you have a 
discovery that implicates a protein drug target or a biochemical pathway, you can go to the pharma pipeline and if there are medications developed for humans or for any other species, it's very likely that those will have a lot of data on dogs, including safety data. And that means you can go directly from discovery to uh, efficacy, efficacy studies in companion animals. And that's what I'm proposing needs to be done to accelerate drug discovery and development for, for both dogs and humans. So now I'll tell you about our studies. And the first study I'll tell you about is uh, mapping breed stereotypes of behavior. And that is based on two types of data. First, we take CBARC owner questionnaires of problem behaviors in uh, pet dogs. At the time, we had about 50,000 dogs in the resource created by James Serpell, who is a, a member of the team in, on all of these studies I'm telling you about. And we take the scores of different behaviors and calculate the mean uh, breed by breed. The second data that we use is dog genetic data, specifically single nucleotide polymorphisms on uh, genome-wide arrays. And from that, we calculate the breed allele frequencies for all the SNPs. So here's a principal components analysis of nine fear and aggression traits in dogs. And we're comparing the pattern in two cohorts. A PCA allows you to take complex data and visualize uh, points that are similar or not similar. And so what we wanted to do first is to compare the two cohorts to see if the patterns were similar for these nine behaviors. And um, the patterns were very similar and immediately suggested uh, biological facts. A quick point, the cohort on the right is 11 breeds. The one on the left is 29 breeds. All 11 breeds on the right are present on the left. And uh, for both cohorts, we only used about a third of the dogs so that we could do validation studies on the remaining dogs. So the first suggestion that we see from the PCA is that unfamiliar directed fear and aggression are related to each other as pertains both to humans and dogs as their objects. Secondly, the most distant from those traits is owner-directed aggression, and that suggests that these two things are genetically different. We also looked at the same principal components, but now uh, showing the breeds. And the first thing that jumps out of this is that the breeds that overlap the two cohorts have essentially identical patterns. So that's very encouraging. The second thing you notice from this is that the uh, component one, which explains 60% of the variance in cohort one, 76% of the variance in cohort two, the most extreme points on PC1 are the Chihuahua, the Dashhand, the Yorkie and the Toy Poodle, which basically suggests a third thing, which is that small body size is a major effect in PC1, which is the largest effect overall. And all of those suggestions from the PCA had already been proposed by behaviorists. And, um, and so that was consistent it turns out all three predictions are borne out by the genetics. So here I'm showing you Manhattan plots of four GWASs 
each one is performed on two cohorts. And when you see a line, it means that both cohorts are uh, showing the same, um, the same large effect loci, which I've marked here with the blue arrows. And so basically, unfamiliar fear, unfamiliar aggression, both in dogs and in uh, directed both at dogs and humans are associated with two large effect loci, chromosome 18 and X chromosome. So that uh, supports the first PCA suggestion. And it basically tells us that most dog aggression results from fear, something we already knew from behavioral studies. And this is reminiscent of what Gandhi said, the enemy is fear, we think it is hate, but it is fear. This uh, genetic mapping basically proves the second and third suggestions from the PCA. Basically on top, you have unfamiliar directed aggression, on bottom, familiar, you have human on the left, dog on the right, and what you see is that unfamiliar directed is chromosome 18 and X are the, the large effect loci. In uh, familiar directed, it's chromosome 15, which is the insulin growth factor one locus, IGF-1. And that is the same variant that has the largest effect on small body size in dogs. And strikingly, on owner-directed aggression, we also map the receptor for IGF-1. That is very encouraging when you map the ligand and the receptor for the same growth factor. And lastly, we validated the genetic mapping doing predictive modeling. And the way we did it was to take the four replicated loci for the nine fear aggression traits. We now created a predictive model that we tested on 18 breeds that were excluded from the discovery. And the result is that we were able to predict much better than you would, would expect by chance. And this applies for to some breeds. Uh, for the Gordon Setter, we made all of the predictions correctly for the nine traits. For the Sharpay and two other breeds, we got eight out of nine. But at the other end, we have the Bernese and the Border Collie, and we only predicted one correctly for those. The interpretation is that this model and these loci applied to many breeds, but not all of them. The next thing that, um, so I'll just summarize uh, this first study before we go on. We mapped 16 loci in at least one cohort. Four of the loci would, were replicated. Three of those four are associated with body size, all in the same direction. And we, rep, we uh, supported the mapping using predictive modeling. So now I'm gonna tell you a second, about a second study that expanded on the first study. And it expanded, expanded it by including other traits besides fear and aggression. Now we included all of the CBARC traits, which are mostly problem traits, but also energy, excitability, trainability. And the second major change is that we added a third cohort for this study. So the findings of the study was that we mapped 90 loci and we replicated 21 of those in at least one other cohort. Because another group, McLean, Serpel, and colleagues had done something similar but controlling for body size in the mapping, we were able to ask other questions, including what is the effect of body size and um, does problem behavior in dogs have a similarity to the general genetic factor 
of psychopathology in humans. That's called the P factor, and it's a genetic factor associated with all common psychiatric traits in humans. The first thing we did was to identify all of the candidate genes in the 21 replicated loci, and then look in the human catalog of genetic mapping and see if they were mapped for brain traits or other traits. And we did see enrichment for brain trait mapping of these genes in humans. And we see that there seems to be a pattern that the genes we mapped are pleiotropic. They're not only involved with one brain behavior, but multiple brain traits, and they're associated with non-brain traits as well. The strongest effects we see are for height and body mass index. That's actually very interesting because in our study, the largest genetic effect related to human map traits is for height, but when body mass was controlled for, the strongest effect was seen for body mass. So this suggests that the two dog studies are genetically uh, relevant to each other and support each other. We next look at the two gene sets, our study and controlling for body size. Ours was 108 protein coding genes. The other was 715 genes. When you compare the two, the overlap was 19 genes, which is much higher than you would expect by, <clears throat> than you would expect by chance. And the next thing we did was to do transcription factor prediction for both gene sets and compare them to each other. On this table, on the left column, you see the list of transcription factors. The ones that are in bold overlap the prediction for both gene sets in the top 20 for both. That's a very striking overlap and already tells you that there's a biological overlap between the two gene sets. And strikingly, it turns out that two of our top 10 transcription factors were actually mapped in the dog behavior mapping studies in at least one of the two studies and one in both. And lastly, when you look at what was enriched for transcription factors, we see enrichment of hawks and fox families and we see enrichment of transcription factors involved in neurodevelopment. Other biology that we got from gene set enrichment includes looking at genetic mapping in humans to look for overlap with psychopathology, intelligence, and brain structure. And uh, those findings were all significant, uh, showing uh, enrichment for each of these three uh, types of traits. And secondly, we found evidence that neurogenesis in humans and mice are enriched in the dog mapping study. And we see that at the level of transcription factors involved in human neocortex development. And we see it from single cell RNA sequencing data from mice in the developing hypothalamus. We also looked at genomic demographics, and I'll point out a handful of the interesting observations. Uh, first, we saw that the dog mapping was enriched for genes under positive selection in dogs. We saw very strong signal of enrichment for human genes undergoing accelerated divergence. That means that they're evolving rapidly in the human lineage, and presumably that's because they're involved in adaptation in humans. And it's striking that we're seeing that the same genes are uh, under selection in dogs. 
And lastly, we see enrichment for human haploinsufficient disease genes. And intriguingly, that is only enriched in our study, which suggests that that group of genes is related to growth and height. And it's not a general property of uh, selection and behavioral genetics in dogs. Next, we wanted to see if there were any associations of brain structure and our top loci. And uh, for that, we teamed up with Erin Hetch at Harvard, and she has been developing breed-specific uh, MRI imaging of uh, brain structure differences. And she has shown that uh, when she does MRI across different breeds that she can see brain regions that are correlated in increased or decreased volume in, co in concert with each other. And uh, I'm showing you an example, independent component one of six, and in blue are the regions that are increasing in size, in red the regions decreasing in size uh, correlated with each other, and in this case, the two regions most uh, affected by increased size are the cingulate gyrus and the caudate nucleus, and therefore, that independent component one is called drive and reward. So we tested for each marker to be associated with each of the six independent components, and we found evidence for four of the independent components. The associations circled in blue here are the ones that were observed in at least two cohorts. And here's a couple of those findings that I think are, are quite striking. Uh, the first is chromosome 15, which is associated with small body size. We mapped it for familiar aggression, and it's associated with IC1, drive and reward. The second one here, chromosome 18, we mapped for unfamiliar fear and aggression, and it's associated with IC4, social action and interaction. And Erin Hatch, when she saw this, immediately recognized what it suggests, which is that familiar aggression based on this association with brain structure changes is suggestive of proactive aggression, drive and reward. In contrast, chromosome 18 is associated with unfamiliar fear and aggression. It's associated with social action and interaction, and this suggests that that type of fear and aggression is reactive. And both of these regions were associated with IC5, which is fear, stress, and anxiety, or HPA axis. So this is very provocative biology that we need to follow up on now. And so the summary of the second part or second study is that uh, there were two genetic mapping studies of dog behavior with and without controlling for body size. We showed how they are supporting each other and how they are different from each other. Secondly, we showed by gene set enrichment that the dog mapping is uh, relevant to human psychopathology, and it's relevant to human and mouse neurogenesis. And lastly, the brain structure analysis suggests the distinction between proactive versus reactive aggression, which is a very interesting biological question. And so now I'm going to tell you of a third study that uses a very different approach. And here we used individual level genotype and phenotype. 
as opposed to the discovery mapping across breeds. The cohort that we use for this work is 400 dogs, about half and half pedigree and mixed breed, and 122 of them had a veterinary behavioral diagnosis made by doctors uh, Megan Heron and Leanne Lilly at OSU uh, Veterinary Hospital. And 15% of the cohort was pit bull type dogs. So again, it's a population sample. And each dog, again, I wanna stress, each dog had a CBARC questionnaire and some other questions answered as well, and had genotypes at 20 markers at 13 top loci that, that we mapped. We created three logistic regression models. One had all of the data in the study, we call that the full model. Another one is called the individual model, it takes each predictive variable each predictive variable individually and the third is a fixed threshold where you establish a case control status by using quantile values of CBARC at 50 to 95 percentiles so here's an example of the results for chromosome 18 using the full model and you'll recall that we mapped uh, unfamiliar directed fear and aggression to chromosome 18. And here in this study, we're seeing it associated with stranger directed aggression and dog directed aggression. So unfamiliar human and dog directed aggression. Um, and we also see that it has a decreased risk on pulling on the leash. And here's the reminder, these two breeds, the Yorkshire Terrier and the Dachshund, are breeds that have high frequency of this chromosome 18 allele. But I'm including this picture here to illustrate that humans treat dogs differently depending on different traits they have. And one of those is small body size. Here is the full model on pit bull type dogs. And what's interesting here is that we did not detect any aggression or fear traits using the full model. We did show increased pulling on the leash and decreased excitability in pit bulls. And the other associations that are worth mentioning here are if there were children in the home, the dog was more likely to have anxiety traits. If the dog had a non-behavioral illness, it was more likely to have coprophagia or, uh, or feeding on uh, feces. If a dog was a working dog, it was more likely to have separation-related problems. If a dog was a competitive dog, it had increased aggression directed at familiar dogs, but reduced fear of unfamiliar humans and dogs. That's a very interesting biological set of findings that uh, this last competitive dog um, set of associations, again, is suggestive of the difference between proactive and reactive aggression, but in this case, in a very complicated um, context. Um, we also showed in the threshold models that pit bull type dogs have reduced owner directed aggression at the 75th quantile and increased risk of dog directed fear at the 95th. This is a very striking, very suggestive finding uh, on the one hand, pit bulls have less owner-directed aggression, which is proactive, and at, at the top 
of um, the most fearful dogs, there's a um, an enrichment of pit bull type dogs. And so uh, this is suggesting that uh, there's a small percent of pit bulls that have reactive fear. And again, that's a very interesting biological question to follow up. And lastly, we did two separate studies, one of any diagnosis and the other one of specific diagnoses. And um, here we're taking these uh, 20 markers at, at uh, 13 loci. And at the top, you can see that four of the loci are associated with any diagnosis. And um, for chromosome 15, we see association with a behavioral medication. Again, that's the IGF-1 small dog locus. For individual diagnosis, diagnoses, we identified three loci associated with anxiety and one locus associated with aggression. And this is not only exciting because it supports the mapping by a different approach, but it also suggests clinical utility of genetic testing for behavior. And uh, in the near future, it could easily be used for breeding purposes, but you can imagine it also being used for diagnosis and for treatment purposes in the near future. So the final conclusions are that we identified 800 genes associated with dog behavior in our study and in the study controlling for body mass. In our work, we supported our findings by replication and by predictive modeling. And we found brain structure associations that suggest specific biology to explore further. We showed chromosomes 18 and X are associated with fear and aggression directed at unfamiliar dogs and humans. And chromosome 15 is associated with aggression directed at familiar dogs and familiar humans. We showed gene set associations with neurogenesis or neurodevelopment as well as psychopathology factor from humans. And that evidence we see both in mice and humans. And lastly, I showed you that we can use genetic testing to predict problem behavior in dogs. And again, I think that's very exciting going forward um, using that information for breeding and medical purposes. So with that, I'd like to thank the contributors and sponsors, especially Isain Zapata. He was the first author of the osteosarcoma paper and the three behavioral papers. And um, I want to thank my collaborators as well as the funding agencies. And uh, a great big thanks to the participants as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez. I'm a, I'm a bit of a dog behavior nerd as well as a dog breeder, and I've been looking forward to this, uh, this session for, oh, pretty much ever since I saw the agenda. So thank you so much for sharing that um, really fascinating and in-depth research with us. One question maybe to, to get you started is um, genetics and dog behavior is something that you often hear people talk about as too complicated and too many other factors. So what sort of led you down the road of this line of research? Um, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here at the Embark conference um, and to uh, meet you, Karen. So thank you. Um, so one day uh, we were doing genetic mapping and I actually do a lot of the bioinformatics myself. And 
Um, I just happened by accident to bump into James Serpell's book chapter showing sea bark scores in uh, different breeds. And we actually, before we even contacted him, we actually converted his graphs into the, um, the means and the variance of the, of the scores across breeds. And uh, we did some preliminary studies seeing if it was mappable or not. And the signal was quite strong. And um, it was one of those eureka moments. Um, I, I had always thought, oh, how are we going to phenotype behavior? You have to standardize it. You need uh, a large group of people. You need a large sample. And then when I saw Seabark and realized they already had 50,000 owner questionnaires and the questionnaire covered essentially all of the major problem behaviors, uh, again, I just fell out of my seat and uh and yelled eureka and immediately ran over to isain zapata's desk he was the postdoc at the time and uh and we immediately got to work on it well a happy accident that that uh that all those factors sort of came together to to bring us to this point um it's actually one of the questions we have sort of builds on that. It, it's specifically around looking, have you looked at the brain differences in dogs with specific functions? So say bur hunting dogs versus herding dogs or protection dogs or livestock guardians. I know you touched on the models fitting different breeds um, to different degrees of, um, of predictability. And so have you looked at groups of breeds as part of that analysis yet? Yeah, so that that's all Aaron Hetch, Hetch's work, and uh, that is one of her major questions. Is um, her, she basically has a, a very sort of striking biological interest, which is the the interaction of evolution and development. And if you just sit, sit and think about that for one second you realize how challenging that is. But at the same time, if you're going to do it in any species, dogs are really probably the most ideal, um, even compared to any model organism, because there's a lot of variation, but within that you have 400 breeds or more. Um, and so traits like herding are, a major interest for Aaron. They are for us as well. Um, I'm also extremely interested in the whole concept of tameness and what made domestication possible. Um, so we, we think about how close wild animals are willing to get to humans, and, and you see that in wolves. And so it's a widely held idea that in order for domestication to happen, dogs had to have, uh, or wolves had to reduce their fear of humans. They had to reduce their aggression towards humans. And so this is uh, very similar to the fox domestication experiment of Belayev. And, um, and so that's, Another major question for me is, um, are, are we seeing, when we see reduced aggression, are we seeing loci that were selected in the domestication process? Super interesting. Um, and, and different breed types might, might give you different answers to that too, I wonder. Um, yeah, well, one of the questions fun. I think was covered a little bit in the presentation when you talked about the, the some of the associations you found, but it's really around how did you incorporate information on the environmental influences, for example, children in the home? Um, so basically, in addition to CBARC, we had a questionnaire that had things like the source of the dog, was it from a pet shop, was it from uh, a shelter, um, and from these various questions we could 
uh, see things like what is the effect of having children in the home? What is the effect of having other dogs or other animals in the home? And um, that was basically the extent of what you're asking about. And we, we know that it goes way beyond that. I showed an example of uh, human attitudes that look at small dogs as almost as if they're toys, that people will carry them in their purses. They call them teacup dogs. Uh, they have them married in elaborate ceremonies like in the picture I showed. And, um, and those types of attitudes are related to the morphology of the dog for example, I believe also to the behavior, but um, you can see people interacting with a deer hound versus a Yorkie in very, very different ways. And that has to impact the behavior of the dog. Right, right. Well, yes, let's not carry around our deer hounds in our, in our handbags. Um, imagine, so imagine if you were, imagine if you were a dog and you had children in the home versus no children in the home. Um, I mean, I observe that all the time here at my house, and uh, it's a very striking environmental effect. Absolutely. So unfortunately, we are out of time. We do have um, a number of other fantastic questions that have been submitted. We will send those over to you, um, and if and maybe we can get them answered and, and post it up in, in some of the um, outcomes from the summit. I will remind our uh, audience that coming up immediately is our second panel of the day, Perspectives on the Human-Canine Bond, uh, which is moderated by Dave Diefenbach. Um, and don't forget to explore beyond the presentations, the whole event space with the uh, science lab, the press room, the barking lot. There's a ton of stuff out there. So thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez, for your time and sharing uh, this research with us. And uh, I wish everyone else to have a fantastic rest of the summit. Thank you, Karen, and I look forward to seeing all the questions.